Grace, mercy, and peace belong to you. They're free gifts from the one who was and is and is to come. Amen. Do me a favor, will you? For the next few minutes, try to turn off the left side of your brain. Just click it off. You know, it's that analytical part, that analytical part of you that always wants to find the right answers. And turn on the right side. That's the part that psychologists like to say is your artistic or creative side, or the part many of us deny even having or feeling very good about. I'd like you to try to do this, because when it comes to the Bible, I think too many of us only bring the left side of us to work, always trying to figure out just what it is a passage is telling us to do or how to be. And often we just close the book, we close Scripture, feeling frustrated because we just don't quite get it. And my theory is when that happens, we're working way too hard at trying to pull literal meaning instead of even subconsciously telling Scripture what we want it to say. In other words, we're looking, we, we look too often to Scripture to support what we already think. We turn to Scripture looking for validation and vindication of what the left side of us wants us to hear. Instead of just letting the text speak to the right side of us, the place where our heart thumps and the place where closed doors might pop open if we could allow our imagination to listen to what the Spirit of God has in mind. Now for many of us, I know this attitude can take some getting used to, maybe a lot of getting used to. But it's worth the effort because a lot of Scripture, maybe the majority of it, wants to speak to the right side of our being. And one of the best places I know of to experience this connection is by turning to the Psalms. The Psalms are the beating heart of the Bible, the bridge between the Hebrew Testament and the New Testament, where we find Jesus constantly coming back to the poems and songs of his Jewish heritage, including as the source of his final words on the cross. I look at the Psalms is the prayer book of Jesus. So if they were important to Jesus, perhaps they need to matter to us. And this morning, I want us to explore one of the more well-known psalms, Psalm 91. And hear it speak to our hearts through this contemporary hymn that you just heard, On Eagle's Wings, which the choir sang in, in place of our normal lectionary reading. On Eagle's Wings, as hymns go, is relatively new, maybe about 40 years old. But in that time, its lullaby-like interpretation of the psalm has made it probably the most frequently requested hymn at funerals and other times of distress perhaps second only to Amazing Grace. And a National Association of Church Musicians not too long ago named it, get this, the number one liturgical hymn of all time. Imagine that. And yet it's probably not all that familiar to some of you. What is it about the image of being carried on the wings of, e of an eagle carried on the wings of an eagle. Something not even directly mentioned in the psalm itself. And what is it about some of the, the, the psalm's other images of refuge and shelter? What is all of that, why does all of that combined just reassure us so much? You know, the many images of God. 
that of an eagle doesn't come readily to mind, for me at least. I suspect for most of us. Because since, since we're only human, we tend to think of God as, well, this kind of bearded, grandfatherly-like figure, largely because Genesis tells us that we are made in the image of God, and so therefore God must have human qualities, right? And particularly, to the uh, chagrin of half of us, pr prominently male features, right? But a giant bird with eight-foot wings and talons of steel, how is that comforting? Who is that God? And is that who... That's who we really think God is? But to help you, I hope, understand what I believe the psalmist in this case was experiencing, I need to put you to work. I need you to close your eyes. Close your eyes. For you know we can see better that way. We can see better when our eyes are closed. Now take a deep, cleansing breath. And in your mind's eye, I want you to picture a very high, steep, mountainous cliff rising hundreds of feet in the air. And near the top of this sheer edifice of granite, you see a niche chiseled from the rock. A niche deep enough to allow a large nest to be tucked inside. And in that nest are one or two baby eaglets. And perched on both sides, hovering over the nest, are their parents. You, my friends, are one of those eaglets, nervously rocking back and forth as the strong head and beak of the father eagle with determination nudges you over the edge of the nest, and suddenly you are in this breathtaking free fall down the face of the cliff, frantic flapping of tiny wings and kicking of legs, and you're scared to death. But then, whoosh, you pop down on the outstretched and giant sinewy wings of your father, who bears you slowly and silently back up to safety. You were born up on eagle's wings. Before you can fly, you must brave the terror of falling. Now, unless you've fallen asleep on me, you can open your eyes. Our spiritual ancestors in the faith were familiar with the gentle but tough love, protective parenting skills of eagles. Eagles were all over the place in the land of the Bible. There were more than 30 different varieties, and the authors of some of the first books of the Bible drew upon what they saw in the wild as a model for how Israel, as God's chosen people, was being carried through times of uncertainty. As an eagle stirs up its nest and hovers over its young, as it spreads its wings, takes them up, and bears them aloft on its pinions, the Lord alone guided God's chosen. So says the author of Deuteronomy. And as God spoke to Moses at the foot of Mount Sinai before the people of the Exodus entered the land of Canaan, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you up on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Such is the account from the Song of Moses in Exodus 19. Now the imagery of Psalm 91 is not for everyone. Those whom I would call charitably Functional atheists. I wonder what all the wing flapping is all about. Functional atheists are everywhere. You know who they are. Those who say they believe in God. Even come to church occasionally. 
but don't really commit to the leap of faith because deep down something about the idea of voluntarily falling before you can soar, something about that idea just offends their need to be in control of their own destiny. But for those who do make that first foray out of the nest, Psalm 91 is an ode to trust in God's protective care, as well as a promise from the Creator. And I quote, Those who love me I will deliver. I will protect those who know my name. When they call me, and that means as in prayer, I will answer them. Psalm 91 is for all of those times when faith and doubt just kind of collide and crash into each other and you feel lost and frightened, out of control, as if life itself were in that same free fall as a baby eaglet. And for all those times of just how can this be happening, Psalm 91 in its rich Im imagery says, in effect, God's got you. Like the girl brought back or the woman healed in Mark's gospel for today, it only takes an instant of faith in one moment in time to feel grasped by God. Perhaps you can remember just such a time in your own life, the moment when you just knew. Couldn't explain it but you knew that God had you. In the metaphor of eagle's wings, God has us in two ways. The outstretched wings suggest God will catch us and bring us to safety at just the right moment, letting us fall in freedom but not fall too far. But the outstretched wings also picture a different kind of protection in the shadow of his wings, we can picture sanctuary, a secure place to be, as in shelter, as in the way outstretched wings resemble what? When you see this, when you see the outstretched wings of a giant eagle, what else do you see? Do they resemble the shadow of the cross? under which Jesus gathered a broken humanity to himself. Whether it's the picture of Jesus as the mother hen in Luke gathering Jerusalem to himself, or the eagles in the Old Testament swooping to rescue, the protective covering of outstretched wings is supremely Christological. The shadow of the cross looms large, over the story of God's salvation, just as the outstretched wings of the eagle. But there's a danger. There's a real danger in taking this imagery too far. And I think you know what it is. For it will not do at all. It won't do, it just doesn't work. For Christian worshipers to pretend that faith helps one avoid doubt or fear or the difficulty of suffering or the challenge of death even. Such suggestions ri risk promoting the, out the symbol of the out outstretched wings, symbol of the cross. They risk turning the cross into some form of magic talisman rendering the claims of the gospel implausible and alienating those who experience hardship. And I dare say there isn't a person in here who hasn't experienced some form of pain and hardship, suggesting somehow they maybe lack sufficient faith to keep bad things from happening to good people. But try as we might, bad things do still happen to good people. We can explain but not dismiss calamity by drawing strength from Paul's assurance in Romans that nothing can separate us from the love of God. 
But in times of transition, we can only accept in humble trust that God won't let us go. That God will meet us on the other side. That God will be there at the moment of God's choosing for God's purpose. It's, it's the same humble acceptance that led Jesus to quote Psalm 31 from the cross. Remember? Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Psalm 91, and I encourage you to spend some time with it. Let some of the words and phrases seep into the sacred space of your own sanctuary, the sanctuary of your soul. Psalm 91 represents a sub substantial movement away from alienation and abandonment toward hope and renewal of life. Psalm 91 carries us from the troubling mystery of theodicy, which is how a loving God can allow bad things to happen, and pushes us toward the empowering memory of God, the memory of who God is, the character of God, and the knowledge and recognition of all that God has done before in catching us from bawling. And this sweeping poem to faithfulness bears us up once more to the memory that if God did it once, we can surely trust that God will sweep us up again. And it's this reality, beloved. It's this reality that I want us to pursue next week when we will consider in greater depth how God's actions in the past shape our present moments and guide us into the future. May you rest on the eagle's wings. Shalom and amen.